and Bernstein McLeod Bailey of Team Westport. This evening, the Westport Library and the community are continuing with the next activity in our programming for Westport Reads 2021. Our overall theme is toward a more perfect union, confronting racism. Our conversation this evening will be quite interesting and dynamic. We are certainly looking forward to it. This discussion will be about the book, Baseball's Leading Lady by Andrea Williams, whom we welcome to Westport, although virtually. Ms. Andrea Williams is an author and journalist who worked in marketing and development for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in her hometown of Kansas City, Missouri from 2004 to 2007 before returning to writing full time. She now lives and writes in Nashville, Tennessee. Ms. Williams has a degree in sports management. Her dream at one point was to be in the front office of a major league baseball team. How about that? She may still get there, but in the meantime, she is truly passionate about telling our history, particularly in order to fill the gaps in children's literature. Baseball's leading lady does this quite well. In conversation tonight with Ms. Williams is our own Ramin Ganeshram, who is both an award-winning journalist and historian and is currently the executive director of the Westport Museum for History and Culture, formerly the Westport Historical Society. Ramin's area of study has been colonial era African-American history, particularly focused on enslaved African-Americans and mixed race people. She has been widely recognized for evolving the 131 year old Westport Museum toward an inclusive interpretation of local history as part of the larger American story by focusing on race, ethnicity, and gender. In recognition for her work as curator of the Westport Museum's 2018 to 2019 exhibit entitled Remembered the History of African Americans in Westport, Ramin received the prestigious award for leadership in the museum field from the New England Museum Association. Remembered also won awards of merit from the Connecticut League of History Associations and the coveted award of excellence from the American Association for State and Local History. In 2019, Ramin was also awarded the Paul Cuffey Memorial Fellowship for the Study of Minorities in American Maritime History. A professional chef, Ramin is also the author of 10 books focused on food, cooking, and food history. So thank you to both of you. After their conversation, there will be time at the end for questions. The chat function for this program is disabled. However, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions. So with that, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's so, so exciting to speak to you, especially since for me, your book is, is an area of history that in fact, I know very little about until I read your book. And now I feel prepared <laughs> to be able to discuss it because it was so amazingly researched and incredibly interesting. Um, so first I wanna talk really, before we get into the book, as Bernstein mentioned, your initial career interest was to be the GM uh, of a baseball team. And um, which of course only now we're starting to see really um, gains for women and women of color in managerial and executive roles in professional sports. Um, so, you know, why baseball? That's what I want to know. Like, where, where did that come from? I don't know. It's, it's such an interesting thing. And I will say this is the first time I don't have like a pat answer for this because in all the times that I've said this, no one has ever said why baseball and maybe <laughs> I, I mean, maybe because baseball is just not as popular anymore, but I don't know. I just, I just always loved the game. I grew up, um, you know, watching it. I grew up in Kansas city. So, you know, went to Royals games, but also, you know, we had, we had TBS. So I watched a lot of Atlanta Braves games and we had WGN. So I watched a lot of Cubs games and, you know, the Seattle Mariners were my favorite 
favorite team. And it was just the 90s were a really exciting time in baseball, um, you know, with Ken Griffey Jr. and a lot of diversity amongst stars. It's one of the things that, you know, in, in baseball circles, we hear a lot of conversations about in terms of, you know, what is it going to take to get more people excited about the game? Is it the pace of game? Is baseball too slow? You know, where where are the diverse, where is the diversity um, of superstars? Like, who are these kids going to look to? If, if kids want to be Steph and LeBron, you know, in the basketball space, who are they looking to in baseball? So I feel like when I was growing up, maybe I was just the crazy baseball girl, but I do feel like, you know, it was, it was just a different era it was cool it was exciting and as much as I also you know love the NBA because you know this is this is when Michael Jordan was at his height I wanted to work in baseball um and I just I never even cons- I mean I understood that there weren't a lot of people that looked like me but I guess I was just crazy enough that I wanted to you know try to figure out how to get there on my own I was just really intrigued by the business side of it. Like if, if Moneyball had come out, like when I was growing up, like I would have, like, I can just see myself like rereading the book multiple times and watching the movie over and over again. Cause that is just how I was. I was always really interested in the business side of the sport. You know, I'm at the game, like looking at the signage, particularly if you go to minor leagues, baseball games, there's like so much signage in the outfield. And I'm like, what is, what is the return on that? Like, are these companies actually making money? Like how are these stadium financing deals? How does that actually work? Like our taxpayers, like, what is the, like, what are the logistics behind that? Like, what is the actual return for the tech? Like all of those things were where my mind always went even beyond the action of the field. So I knew pretty early that I wanted to study sport management. And then I was like, yeah, I think I want to actually work, um, you know, in the front office. I knew it would probably take a while to get to the position of general manager, but I wanted to work up through the marketing side. Um, you know, a lot of people come up through the legal side. I wanted to, I was going to get a, a dual MBA JD, but I didn't really want to, I wasn't that interested in legal. I just knew that a lot of people in that position had a law degree. So it was a necessary evil, but I wanted to work up on the marketing side and I wanted to work in small market baseball. So a team like, you know, the Kansas city Royals, where I grew up, I was really adamant that like, I didn't want to work for the Yankees, right? Like this team is marketing itself. Like they are the New York Yankees. I wanted to really, um, you know, give, be of service to, to a team that wasn't getting the shine that I felt like it should have. So I, I thought all this stuff out and then here we are, I'm doing something totally different, but, but yeah, it's all good. It's all good. But I mean, what's amazing is that um, the way you were looking at it, even at, you know, at a young age and, and through school, this whole time, there was Effa Manley who had done this and, and looked at it just the way you did. And you, t- you write in the book very, um, in the introduction about um, how you, you came, you know, you had started at the, at the museum, right? And can you tell the story how you were doing a walkthrough of the exhibits and then you, and then you saw Effa, right? You saw yeah. of her in a text panel. Yeah. So Bob Kendrick, who's the president now, gave me a tour on my first day. Um, And I knew I knew about the Negro Leagues in the sense that I knew that it existed, that there was a Josh Gibson and a Satchel Paige. Um, But I think like a lot of people, I didn't consider, you know, the, the people on in the front offices, the people on the managerial side who were, you know, serving in executive roles, the people that actually made it possible for Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson to play on teams. I had never considered that. So we are, the museum is set up chronologically. Um, the, the focal point, the centerpiece of the museum, if you will, is the field of legends. And there are these life-size bronze statues. And the idea is that after you learn the history of black baseball, starting you know in the late, teen, late 1800s, after you work all the way through, so past integration in Jackie, and then in those years in the 50s where we have some women take the field, then you are able to go and take the field, be on the field of legends with these bronze statues of, you know, Satch and Josh, but also Oscar Charleston and Buck Leonard, cool Papa Bell. Um, And so we're like halfway through, we're in like the thirties and forties. And there's like this picture of this woman and there are no women right up until this point. Like again, at the end, you get to the fifties, there's Tony Stone and Mamie Peanut Johnson. But at this point, there are no women. And I mean, you know this because you're in the museum space, but there's no wasted space. Like there's nothing there that is not there with intention and purpose. So I'm like, who is she? 
why is she here? She's obviously really important. So um, yeah, Bob told me a little bit about who she was and what she did with this team with the Newark Eagles. Um, but it wasn't until I kind of started reading and researching on my own that, you know, I got a full understanding of how significant she was to this, to this era of segregated baseball. You know, she, she ran um, this, this team with her husband. She was really responsible for the day-to-day of it though, but she was also really involved in the operations of the Negro National League, which her team was a part of. So she just, yeah, all the things that I could have ever dreamed of wanting to do, she did, but she did it in the thirties and forties. So it was like, like the little emoji with the brain popping. <laughs> <laughs> she faced she faced um you know not only the fact you know of you know racism and you know because the book does talk about that they will talk about it the tension between um you know the national baseball leagues right the white leagues right and this and 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 um you know, integration and segregation and so on. So she faced that, but also as a woman, right? You have a wonderful story about how um, even before they got to become a baseball uh, owning couple, they were very prominent in Harlem and there was a department store on 125th street, right? That um, benefited greatly from the black community's consumer dollars, but did not hire black clerks and salespeople and, you know, front facing people. And Ethel led a protest of all, you know, really led by herself and prominent wealthy black women in Harlem and basically, um, you know, stopped the influx of consumer dollars into the department store until they agreed to change their ways. And you tell a story about her in a meeting um, with the store owner. And she says, essentially, you know, if our women, if, you know, some of these ladies, uh, there's two choices for them, right? Why don't you tell the story about what she did and kind of shut down the room? Yeah. You know, white yeah, she, men and yeah. Yeah. She essentially, you know, said the, the employment options were very, very slim for black women. And as you mentioned, you know, they, they were still responsible for all of this money flowing into the stores. 70, 75% of all sales receipts were generated within the black community. Yet the owner of the store was like, eh, yeah, but I don't know if I want to hire you. And F was like, this is ridiculous. And of course they go along and, you know, they've tried to, they've tried to talk to them before, before they, before they staged this full boycott, you know, they, the, she was working with the a local pastor, a black pastor. He went and sat down with the owner of the department store and tried to work it out, tried to come to some kind of negotiation. And this guy is continuing to double down. No, I'm not hiring your people. So by the time we get to this meeting where F is actually there, which is already a big deal, right? This is the 1930s. Like, why is this woman right. in this business meeting from the beginning? Okay. But she is there and she is not there to, you know, kind of be seen and not heard. Like she steps up and is like, Listen, if if these women are not hired, what do you think they're going to do? Become prostitutes? And basically saying like these young girls, the, in the same way the white community cares about its young white girls, we care about young black girls and the fact that they can't find decent jobs. What are you going to do about it? So yeah, it's it's one of those things that I wanted to include it because it's important. The effort that we get to in 1946, 47, you know, as we're talking about integration and everything that's happening, you know, as she's bumping heads with the executives in Major League Baseball, as she's bumping heads with other Black owners, yeah. as they try to figure out a strategy, how do we save ourselves from, from this runaway train, right? As she, as she goes toe to toe with Jackie Robinson, the Jackie Robinson in the press, Effa didn't just become that woman, right? Effa was that in the thirties when she stands up and nobody really knows who she is other than the fact that she has the gall to be a woman in the 1930s and sit up and stand this and stand up and say this in a room full of men. So yeah, it definitely it's primarily white men, right? A room primarily of white men. Let's well, say. the owner was white and she was there with the a black attorney and the black pastor. Right. Yeah. But um, but yeah, but I mean, certainly at that point, the, the white owner has control of the situation. He is right. he is standing in the position of power. They have to convince him to see things from their perspective and to ultimately change his stance on hiring who he's going to hire um, in his department store. And 
the way that they kind of, you know, again, tried to try to rationalize and, you know, be nice and these kinds of, that didn't work. It didn't work until, you know, Effa kind of put her foot down and said the thing that no one else would have been willing to say, quite frankly. Which, which was, I mean, it was kind of her way, right? I mean, she made demands of her players. She made demands of the league. She made, um, you know, demands in terms of not only how they were on the field, but off the field, um, how, you know, how people interacted with each other. And um, she said what she had to say. And yet was very much um, touted as, um, I think I read something that said she was considered one of the most beautiful women of the 1930s, right? And, um, and, and there's a kind of a condescending commentary toward the end of her career and the end of the, toward the end of the, uh, the Negro Leagues where this writer basically says the beauteous Effa Manley, right? So mm -hmm. she was she she kind of managed to keep it all all the balls in the air at, at once. It felt like, yeah. um, I you know I, can you give our viewers our listeners um, sort of a, a, it's impossible to do. So I'm going to ask you the impossible: a okay. brief overview of kind of the world as Effa entered it with Abe as an owner, right? So there were the Negro Leagues, there were the, the you know, I guess the National and the American Leagues as we know them. Um, the discussion about integration was ongoing. There was a lot of resistance. In the earliest, earliest days, there had been some integration. Um, and so can you just kind of tee up our, her world for us, what it was that she came into and was trying to do? Yeah. So at that point, um, Abe and Effa purchased their team in 1935. They start out in Brooklyn. They are the Brooklyn Eagles for that first season. But the New York baseball market is really tight, right? Like Major League Baseball, white baseball has the Brooklyn Dodgers. They have the New York Yankees. They have the New York Giants. So there's already a slew of white teams. There are also quite a few black teams operating out of that New York market as well. Not as members of the Negro National League yet, but, um, you know, independent teams independent barnstorming teams that you know were maybe based there but spent most of their time on the road you know didn't have a home field presence or anything like that um so it was, it was really hard to build an audience that could sustain um sustain the business really you know everything at that point this is this is before merchandise sales and before tv deals so really the money was made through ticket sales. Um, and it was hard to sell tickets in, in that crowded New York market. So the very next year in 1936, they moved to Newark. And at this point, the new Negro National League has been in existence for three years. This is the third season. Um, the first Negro National League was founded in 1920 by Rube Foster. This was the first successful long-standing um, Negro League and Black people had been playing before, but Rube really understood that organization is how you move the Black baseball into the future, how you really create successful, sustainable teams. Um, but that league ended up dying with the Great Depression and also Rue Foster passed away. And he was really the visionary leader of that organization. So once he was gone, it was really just hard to tie it together. Um, Gus Greenlee, who owned the Pittsburgh Crawfords, started this second league in late 1932. They played their first season in 1933. This new Negro National League, unlike the first one that was comprised mostly of Midwestern teams, this new one is based on the East Coast. And so they are, again, in those early years, just really trying to figure out how to stay alive, how to make money, and how to drive Black baseball into the future, right? How do we deal with players who are jumping contracts, who are just out here looking for the highest salary, and they're not really concerned about whatever contract they may have already committed to. If they can make a few more dollars over here, they're willing to do that. How do we deal with the fact that so much of our gate receipts, again, this is, this is how we make our money through ticket sales, but so much of it is lost immediately because we have to pay booking agents we have to pay the white owners of these stadiums to just 
play our games here because, you know, for all of the other reasons, you know, that, that Black people were sort of struggling during this time, Black baseball suffered as well. When you're Black, you don't have the same access to capital, which means you, it's very unlikely that you're going to own a stadium, even if you're able to own a baseball team. So there's always white involvement. And what that white involvement means is so much of the profit that is coming into Black baseball is then being filtered into the hands of white people. So there was always, you know, there were a lot of great things that are happening. You know, this is around the time where we are introduced to Josh Gibson and Satchel Paige, but the world of Black baseball is still quite precarious. Like we, you know, it is, everybody's operating on a shoestring. Nobody's really making a ton of money. They're in it because they love it. And for someone like Effa, it is also an opportunity to advocate for her community. This gives her a larger platform, right? This is this is the woman who led this boycott in Harlem. Well, now she's got a whole baseball team. And now she's got access to the entire Black community of Newark through this team, right? So she's hosting anti lynching protests and raising money for the local chapter of the NAACP. So as much as they struggled on the business side to, to keep their business afloat, Effa always saw the opportunity in Black baseball. And I love what you said about her being beautiful, which in all the interviews I've done, nobody's really talked about that. They've talked about the colorism thing and that she's very, oh. very fair skin, but she was also gorgeous, right? Effa used all, she understood all of these things as privilege. If you're right. really fair skin and you're really pretty, you're going to be able to get in some rooms that other people would not be able to get in. If you also own this baseball team and again, have access to an entire community, you're going to be able to talk to people, to communicate with people, to access people that not everyone can. Well, Effa took that privilege and said, you know what, here's what I'm going to do. She was always very intentional, again, about serving her community. So this is kind of what we're seeing in like the mid thirties. Um, of course, people are talking about um, of, about integration, not so much in the sense of we want to be where you are, but just that it's not right where we are. We know right. that for sure. But as we get into World War II, um, that 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 push becomes stronger. It becomes louder. It is yeah. Well, you sent us overseas to fight, so we need to talk about what's happening right here. 1939. Wendell Smith, who is a sports editor um, for the Pittsburgh Courier, starts entering interviewing white teams when they come in town to play the pirates and asking the players and the managers well, how do you feel about this what do you think about black people playing in major league baseball would you be okay with that would you be okay playing against the team that have black players would you be okay with black players being on your team if you're a manager do you feel comfortable coaching a black player um and he published the results of these informal surveys and overwhelmingly the white people are like, yeah, we cool with it. If they can hang, if they can play, you know, we're fine with that. So all of these things, we've got this confluence, you know, of factors, this kind of perfect storm that is brewing that pushes us into, into the mid forties where now, yes, we've got to make a move here. Integration is imminent. We know that. What does that mean? Not just for white baseball, but also what does it mean for black baseball at the same time though? Black baseball has its best years because now, because of World War II, now because of defense hiring, manufacturing plants that would have otherwise only hired white people are like, we need all hands on deck. Everybody gets a job, everybody gets a paycheck. So now the black community has more money to spend going to baseball games. Now there's more people coming through the turnstiles. Again, this is where the bulk of the money is made for teams. So now these teams are flush with cash in a way they had never been. So we've got the push for integration and we've got the success of the Negro Leagues that are coming and meeting at this point in the mid 1940s. And Effa sees all of this happening and is like, Okay, wait a minute, we gotta figure this out. Right, and, and it's, it's you know, I love what you said about her being really intentional. I read this book and all I could think about her was as a double agent. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like she yeah. got in the room, she got in the door, she had the conversation, she spoke to the media, but it was always in service of the community, right? And that was, and she, and she could have very well, you know, not have done that. She could have said, you know what, I'm good, right? I, you know, I'm, I'm and, and yet, you know, she didn't. and. Um, one thing that I thought I think is really important to talk about is that, you know, Effa wasn't 
um, you know, she wasn't all in on integration. She felt it was important to keep the Negro Leagues going and that, you know, it was important that they exist as an entity and fought really hard and really long toward a solution that actually wasn't integration. Right. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I don't know. And so, and I like to say this, I mean, again, this is a book for kids. Right. Know, adults should read it too. Absolutely. But but, you know, one of the main things that I want to get across is that, you know, if you're 12, 13, 14, and you're reading about, you know, integration or desegregation in American history, we're taught that it was this inherently good thing. Right. But we always did it in this one way that never benefited the Black community, like ever, 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 ever. It always did us immeasurable harm, in fact whether we're talking about baseball or schools or lunch counters, there is always this trauma mm -hmm. inflicted upon the black community in order for us to say, well, we've integrated. And that integration is never complete anyway, because we've just cherry picked a few people and dropped them into this hostile environment. The doors are never open wide for all of us to come in and mix and be on equal terms to have equity. That never happens. Um, but so I don't, I don't want to say that Effa um, wasn't about integration. I just think that she could see, and this is, this is the benefit of having a woman in the room, right? Like, you know, women, we, we multitask, we can, we can think about a lot of things at the same time. And we can, we're also great at forecasting in a way that men sometimes aren't, right? Like men is like, this looks good to me. Let's go. And the woman is like, but actually I can see five years down the road from now, and this is going to be a disaster. Right. And so I think Effa, Effa was doing that. Effa saw that while this might lead to a temporary win, this might make us feel good in the moment to see Jackie with the Dodgers. If we go this route five years from now, we're going to be screwed. So I think ultimately, you know, best case scenario is this fully integrated society, but that's not what Branch Rickey was trying to create. That's right. not what the other executives were trying to create. That's not what, you know, again, if we go back to, to the desegregation of schools, these administrators didn't really want that, or they would have perhaps built a separate school, taken some kids from the black school and some kids from the white school and put them in this new school together and then made everyone figure out how to coexist, but that's never what they did. So I think she just understood again, because this is the time where they are having their best years on, you know, on financially that they've had. And so she wanted to protect that because this isn't just about baseball players having an opportunity to play games. This is about executives like Effa having jobs. This is about publicists and secretaries and all of the people that it takes to make these baseball teams run, which we understand that now. A major league baseball team right now is not just hiring players on the field. There's a whole bunch of people that it takes to keep that machine rolling. Well, Effa understood that because again, she was running this team. Right. Right. And she knew that it wasn't just going to be some of the players who didn't get the call who would be out of jobs. It would be all these other people, too. It would now be, well, where do we send the Black community? Who is going to be there as this beacon of hope for the Black community? You know, Effa, now with, with, the, with the Newark Eagles, she has this, this youth program where she lets Black kids come to the games for free so they can meet, meet their favorite here. Are, are the white teams going to do that? Are they going to provide these same opportunities? So she understood all of that and tried to negotiate for a way that could, that a, a solution, if you will, that would be mutually beneficial, right? White baseball needs Black players, but we need to keep our businesses intact. Mm -hmm. So how about we continue to, to sign and develop these players and then perhaps we can become minor league affiliates, which Major League Baseball did later do with like the Mexican League, for, exist yeah. for example, um, but they don't want to do it with, with the Negro Leagues. They won't do it. So yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting times for sure. Well, I mean, it's, it's what, we, you know, she understood, I think, uh, what we now understand or what we call out as you know, performative anti-racism, mm -hmm. right? Here's exactly. this one or a few things that the, that's going to be done to appear to be anti-racist, but the cohesive plan that creates actual change wasn't there, right? And that's what she she understood, right? right. Um, and you you talked about Mexico and the farm, you know, farm teams are developing players down there, and a lot of players, a lot of the Negro League players in the off season, they went to Mexico, they went to the Caribbean. Dominican Republic and so on, because they could play, they could play without racism. You know, they were beloved, right? 
Um, so that that to me was really interesting, and I and, and as much as I'm you know don't know much about baseball, it sort of started churning my mind about you know some of the great Dominican and you know Caribbean Latinx players that we have now, you know Afro Caribbean players in in the in the American the National League. Um, you know, it, it, I have to say this um, as a historian, I have to say this. You know, when I was reading this um, very early on, you make a point about, um, you know, the mainstream baseball leagues, they were not segregated. And in fact, it was never written into the actual bylaws of the leagues that there would be segregation. It was just um, the preference of the owners or the preference of the players or the assumed preference of the audiences that over you know, time, it then became inculcated into the actual function of the, of the white leagues, right? And it, and it occurred to me, I was reading that, and I was thinking, you know, very like our state of Connecticut that mm -hmm. operated by its colonial charter until 1818 when a constitution was adopted, the colonial charter never disenfranchised people from voting by race. It's because they felt they didn't have to, like it was, right. it was a given right. that it was a white person, but because it wasn't legally there, mm -hmm. um, newly uh, enfranchised black men were voting mm -hmm. in the early 19th century. Um, and then they quickly changed the state constitution and it just felt very parallel to me, right? There actually wasn't a formalized disenfranchisement and then, and then it kind of got built into the leagues. Right. Um, so do you think, do, so you are in this world, you've worked in this world. As you did this research, did anything occur to you like that there could have been a way for the Negro Leagues to continue? Or do you see that there was any pathway that could have, I feel like if there was, Effa would have found it because she was that kind of woman, right? But Well, yeah, I think what she proposed again, that, that the Negro Leagues could potentially become minor league affiliates of Major League Baseball, I think was probably the best case scenario. Um, that said, I, I think, I think this is history, history is so interesting to me because particularly when you're talking about stuff like this, right? Like this is like, you know, Jackie, this is like 20 years from before the modern civil rights movement, as we know it, like these people don't have a clue. They are making it up as they go along, which you could argue even about what's happening right now, you know, in the midst of, you know, all of the, all of the social unrest and the protests that broke out post George Floyd last year, you know, I, I would say that we probably need to read our history so we at least know what not to do. I, I don't think there's a blueprint that exists that says this will get, uh, if we do X, we will get Y. I don't think that exists. I do think now that we more have more information about what doesn't work. Right. Um, but but yeah, in the, in the 1940s, there's they don't have a clue. Like, I can't stress that enough. Like, you know, the way I write about Wendell Smith, I'm like, dude, what a clown. But <laughs> I also, as a journalist, like, I get it, right? We have to show grace to our elders because they just didn't know. Also, what we know about the Black community, too, is that we have only continued to, to survive and thrive in the midst of everything that has happened to us since we've been brought to this country because we choose to think the best, right? Now, sometimes that, well, a lot of times that ends up coming back to bite us, but there is always this hope and this faith that if we take a step the white people will meet us halfway, that they will do what is right. And so there's a lot of that. You can see that happening consistently, right? Like even after, you know, um, Jackie is signed and they find out that Branch Rickey didn't pay the Monarchs for his contract. There's that whole like, well, do we put Branch Rickey on blast? Do we take him to court? Which they could have done, but they didn't want to do that. And I, I understand that there is this always this sense of like, it will work itself out. Mm -hmm. It never worked itself out. But, <laughs> but to your point, I think really that I don't know, I, I can say what I would tell, you know, if this was happening in 2021, I would say, okay, well, this is what I would hundred percent, but I don't, I don't know that, you know, I, I think the beauty of, of telling this story, you know, 
as, as, as thoughtfully and as completely as I try to do is not to say, okay, well, they should have did this or we could have avoided this. I think all those things are true and I've had those thoughts myself. But I think the most important thing is to really learn from it, to really see, okay, they maybe didn't know. They maybe didn't have the experience of hindsight and the people who had come before who tried. We have that now. We have that now. We know that we cannot just rely upon the good faith of white men in power because we're going to be screwed, right? So... (laughs) So I think, I mean, I think that's the thing. I think, you know, for me, again, for in writing this book for kids, it's like, how does that change the conversations in classrooms, right? How does that, how does that change how we view integration? How does that change now how we see when we look at, you know, me, I'm coming up and I'm, you know, I'm 14 and I want to be, I want to be a general manager of a major league baseball team. Nobody looks like me. I don't really know why nobody looks like me. I just know that nobody looks like me. But now that we know this has happened, how does that now change? Right how we view the current situation, how we attack the current situation. Also now, because we know what we were able to accomplish then, how does that change what we are even shooting for or hoping for now? What are we dreaming about now? If you, you know, I, like I said, I was, I, was, I was just that girl. I was just that fan that was dreaming wildly enough to see myself there. But kids need to see it to believe it, right? So how many kids are not even trying for major league baseball's front offices because they're saying yeah nobody looks like me and I don't know if anybody's ever done it well now you know that they have and maybe they made some missteps along the way but they did it and they were successful and now you can do it and be successful too and now you can also avoid their mistakes because here I'm laying them all out for you right so yeah I mean I think so here's you know it's it's you know, we, we talk about the book and, and, and again, we're stressing that, you know, it, it, it's a, it's, um, you know, narrative nonfiction book for, for kids. Right. Um, and I, you know, I do want to stress to everybody listening. It is so engaging. Once you start reading it, you're not thinking, oh, this is a book for kids. Like you're really in to it because the research is fabulous. And I think what's amazing about this in terms of laying out the blueprint and saying, here's what happened let's really take a lesson from it, is that you include their whole world. Mm -hmm. You talk about the Harlem Renaissance. You talk Mm -hmm. about those figures that were controversial in their own way, even within the community, Marcus Garvey, Booker T, right? Like you talk about it. And um, it's such a wonderful way for children to absorb and understand this history without perhaps even knowing that's what's happening, Mm -hmm. right? Because the story itself is so engaging. Um, I'm going to ask you one question because I know that Jennifer is certainly going to want the, the audience to have a chance. Um, I could ask you a million questions, but I'm, only- <laughs> I'm going to ask a question or really just make a statement, um, honestly, because you said something um, at the end of the book before the um, author's note that I just think was so amazing. And as historians, this is something that we are striving to do throughout the telling of black history. And you talk about it, um, and I have a very dear friend who um, does uh, African-American interpretation for New York State Parks. And she always says, we can't always have the story be about plight Mm -hmm. and only plight. Mm -hmm. We have to have, even in that plight, we have to have triumph. We have to have success. We have to talk about um, people who have succeeded or have done everything they can to build hope. I can't um, you know, quite find the line you say, but you say that. You say you wanted to write the story because um, regardless of what happened in the end with the Negro Leagues, this is a story of a very successful black woman who served her community and, and you know, really created a league that built stars, right? Mm-hmm. Rachel Page came out of this league, Jackie Robinson, you know, um, and, you know, I think for that alone, it's important for children to read this book. Yeah. Um, in addition to all the other things that yeah. we said. That was, I mean, that was really, really important to me. Again, I have four kids. My kids are 13, 11, nine, and six, right? And I know what it's like when we get into that kind of, oh, we're going to learn about Black history. Like 99 times out of 100 Black people are on plantations or being chased by dogs and hoses. And it's like, 
did people exist in the 30s and 40s? Um, and yes, we did, right? And we don't, we weren't just, again, when we talk about segregation, there are many reasons, you know, or, or justifications for talking about the negative side of, of segregation. It was born of this ugliness that is, you know, the myth of white supremacy. But if we're not talking about the beauty that came from that, we're not doing our kids a good service, right? Like we're doing them a disservice by not talking about the fullness of our history. What happened when Black people were told, well, you need to go over here and do your own thing? Well, guess what? We did our own thing. We had, right. we had our own stuff, right? Like, and yeah, white people, as white people do, came in and tore it down, you know, lots of times over and over again, you know, we're coming up on the centennial of Greenwood, like. Right. It wasn't the fire and the massacre that killed that community. They rebuilt initially within the first couple of years because they didn't have a choice. Right. They didn't have a choice. We were still heavily in the throes of Jim, Jim Crow segregation. You want to eat at a restaurant, you better tell your homeboys to get a fryer in the back because that's your only option. What tore that community apart was the Federal Highway Act that built a, a highway through the middle of that community. And now they don't rebuild because now they have the option of going to where the white people are and they chose to go where the white people are. But no, I think I think that is really important. I think, you know, for me, I, I'm excited about adults reading this book. I think adults are getting a lot out of it. I, I tried to write it in a way that if you have zero baseball knowledge, if you have zero Negro Leagues knowledge, you can come to this and get it. But it is really about kids. It's about, you know, it, it, as you talked about, you know, there's stuff in there about the Harlem Renaissance and, you know, Marcus Garvey and this kind of these, these dual black thought leaders, right? Because so often we teach kids about these moments as snapshots and then they're forced to connect it or not, you know, but it's like, you know, we learn about the Harlem Renaissance over here and we learn about World War II over here and we learn about, you know, the red summer of 1919 over there, but how does that all connect? Because for the people living in that time, it all connected, right? Rube Foster is in Chicago during the red summer. He is there in, as a black man in America as Marcus Garvey is standing up saying, do for yourself. He is there as W.E.B. Du Bois, like, eh, you might be too dark. Like all of this is happening at the same time. These moments are shaping black people who lived in that era in the same way that you and I are shaped by what's happening in our world right now. I tell people, I can't, you know, Ramin, if I wanted to write, a, you know, a biography about your life and career later, you know, some years from now, and I talked about what happened in 2020, I can't tell your story without talking about coronavirus without talking about the social upheaval, but then also talking about what you do in your work day to day to, to, to disseminate this history to the masses. Like all of it comes together. And I wanted to make sure that it came together for kids in a way that I don't always see in, in textbooks or other, other works written for kids. And, and finally, yeah, we don't, I, again, we're doing a disservice if we're not speaking critically about even people in our own community. I root for everybody black and guess what black people miss it all the time just in the same way that if we're talking about women's empowerment some women don't get it right all the time and we have to be honest about that why not just because this is how you tell history you tell it accurately but also because again we need to we need to understand the missteps of the past if we're going to avoid making those same ones in the future absolutely well well said and thank you so much i'm gonna Turn it over to Jennifer, who I know is like itching to, to ask the questions of the audience. <laughs> Thank I, you. Oh my gosh. Thank you both. This is, I mean, honestly, I don't want to interrupt you too, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Put your so foot we, down. We do have some questions. Um, so, Andrea, what steps should Major League Baseball take to truly integrate management for now? Um, not just increase the numbers, but integrate. On um, in terms of management, or are we talking about players? Um, management, I think more than okay. players, but okay, both. 
Um, so, <laughs> so I actually had a piece that ran today um, on defector.com, defector media, defector.com. Um, but it is about how Major League Baseball has really diminished the history of the Negro Leagues. Even as we get this announcement last fall that says, you know, now we're elevating the status of the Negro Leagues to Major League status and essentially saying, okay, well now Josh Gibson, his stats will sit alongside Babe Ruth's. Even in the midst of that, they're still mostly talking about the players on the field. So I think the very first step, um, you know, which is a point I made about like how how many how many black kids have not even considered trying to become a major league baseball manager or executive just because they don't see anyone, they don't know what's possible. I think the first step is acknowledging that black people have done this, right? Like when we have this conversation about why there are so few black managers or people in executive positions, we're talking about it as if we're going to have to rewrite all the rules. We're going to have to make these exceptions. You know, this is where people get upset about affirmative action because you're just letting people in and they shouldn't really be there. They're not really qualified, but what we do when we when we shine a light on history and we talk about really the history of black people in baseball when we talk about Ethel and Gus Greenlee and Ruth Foster and Composey and all these other people now we're saying of course black people can do these jobs because by the way they did them for so long and they did them well. And so now you not having them there is not this matter of, well, the pipeline's broken and we don't know if anybody's qualified or not. Now we can accurately say, this is just you making a decision to not hire people. Cause we've already been there and done that. That's step number one. Step number two is, is the same thing that it is. You know, I, I cover country music a lot. Um, because it, 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 it deals with a lot of the same stuff, which is like, where are the black people? Like, you know, black people helped create this musical form and now there are no black people in the space. Why is that? And how do we rectify it? Like at some point you just got to pull the trigger, right? Like you're educated beyond your level of obedience. We know black people aren't there because you ain't hiring them. Like at some point you just have to do that. At some point you just have to say, I am going to, in my level of influ my, my sphere of influence right now, do the work that I can to be bring more black people in the door. Okay. It may not be that, you know, if you're, if you're a director of marketing, you know, for some, for some baseball team, no, you're not going to be in charge of hiring the next general manager, but you need to hire black managers and interns right where you are, because those people might end up working their way up to later become a general manager or become a higher level executive. You need to bring those people in now because that is in your power to do. And you need to create a safe space around them so that they stick along, stick around long enough to matriculate and ultimately get to those higher positions. There's something everybody can do where they are, but we end up having these conversations where it's like people are looking for like the magic button or the silver bullet or something that will absolve them of any responsibility because, oh, it's some, somebody else needs to do this thing. Well, no, it's actually you. It's all of us working together, right? Because we know from this history that it's not bringing one person in, right? Jackie didn't change the game for black people. He just did not, right? And we know that just bringing in these tokens or these people who become tokenized doesn't really change it. So it's really an all hands on deck approach. I don't care if I don't see any general managers during the 21-22 season in Major League Baseball, but you tell me that y'all hired 50 Black people at lower levels of those organizations. I understand that now we're trying, we're doing what we can where we are, and there's a, there's a hope, rather, that there will be openings for those people down the line. We just got to do what we can where we are. And, and not to interrupt, but that's what Effa was doing with the department store in Harlem, right? She was like, you owner of this store, you can do something right now. And it's you not wanting to do something, right? That, that's, that's what it is. Like when you, yeah. when you really hold people to task, that's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. If I, if I, if I pass a homeless person on the street and he's telling me he's hungry, I'm not going to sit and wring my hands and say, oh my gosh, this government is not taking care. I'm going to get that man something to eat because he's hungry. Right. Like at some point we have to just do that. We got to just do that. And then that's how, again, these things start, start to fix themselves over time because you create so, this, you know, this, this critical mass of change that ultimately creates those end results that we want. Mm. 
So we also have some, some actually messages of appreciation to you, Andrea. Um, I'm just going to read one here. We have a rich kid baseball history and culture here in Westport. Um, this, <laughs> this viewer didn't grow up knowing about baseball until she married a guy who played baseball and our sons played Little League here. One of them played through college. Um, I don't think any of them know how know much about how important and impactful the Negro Leagues were in the formation of our country's baseball history. Um, thank you so much for educating us about Miss Eva Manley, and thank you for this wonderful book and your personal personal presentation here. Um, so I think we have some people who are going to be reading your book now after this. So um, thank you. That was so sweet, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, um, I'm going to, uh, Cecilia says, um, on your point that Mexican leagues may have a classification of double A or triple A, there was and is no major league affiliation with any of the franchises, making the Mexican league an independent professional league like the Negro League or the Japanese and Korean professional baseball. Um, so her point is that most players in that league make it their career and stay there. Um, there are few Mexican, there are few Mexican alumni playing in major leagues. Um, so there was a little bit of Mexican history there too. Um, I would like to know when you were researching this, was there something that you read that you to that totally took you by surprise, and did you put, use it in the book? Or are you just going to tell us about it now? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I completely by surprise. That's hard because I worked at the museum for so long. So really kind of had a bit of foundational knowledge about this. Um, I think uh, I, if I had to pick something, I would maybe say, um, you know, kind of, kind of the back and forth between her and Jackie when Jackie Robinson, um, you know, after he signed and is playing with the Dodgers, you know, writes this, writes this piece in Ebony magazine that is essentially ripping apart the Negro Leagues. That gave him his start, and F was like, "Yo, what is this? Like, he's lost his mind." Um, and again, I think that's one of those things that just really shows. Um, who Effa was like her character and what she was about like this guy is like the king of the black community at this point and she still you know is willing to push back against him publicly because the things that he was saying ultimately impacted the community at large and not in a good way and she didn't want you know she she understood that there were you know there were still people there were still there were still baseball players who didn't get the call you know there was you know amongst black players no one agreed that Jackie Robinson was the best guy if, if we're talking about on the field skill to to have gotten that call but he did and so she she understood that you know in 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 the wake of him leaving how there were some there was some frustration you know there were some disgruntled players um and how him coming back uh, and again saying all these things you know for the world to see in Ebony magazine just really kind of rubbed salt in some wounds, um, while also, of course, you know, really diminishing the work that she and Abe and, you know, the, the Monarchs owners and, and all these other executives were doing every day just to try to keep those teams and leagues alive. So, um, surprise, I don't know, but I, th I think it's one of those things that I will say su will surprise readers, um, you know, also has how Branch Ricky is positioned. I get a lot that like, oh, I didn't know he was a thief. Um, but I think that's just a testament to how, how we tell history in this country, how we, how we educate the next generation of people. We, we continue to give the same people or people from the same background the pen and allow them to write our stories for us. So we keep getting, you know, just, just 
slightly different versions of the same story and we don't really often get you know these full when, when we talk about Jackie Robinson's story whether it's in the movie 42 or you know the countless biographies about him it is really positioning him alongside Branch Rickey and you know well, what is it like for him as he goes into Major League Baseball into these all-white environments what is it like when he's now in the dugout with these white players some of them who don't you know they don't want him there at all and you know everything that the the entire focus of the story shifts to him in major league baseball we never get what happens to black baseball which really provides the opportunity for him there's no jackie robinson with the dodgers if we don't first get jackie robinson with the kansas city monarchs because he came out of of ucla and playing for the monarchs was really his best and only opportunity to become a professional athlete to get paid to play sports baseball was his worst sport in college, but that was the opportunity that he had to again become a professional athlete. And it is on that team with you know the, the monarchs owners who were white, but a black manager that he was able to develop into the player that then Branch Rickey wanted to later sign. So I think that is I think that is something that we don't always see, even if people are saying, Well, I know this story, I know Jackie, and I know Branch, they will be surprised by by some of that. I, you know, I, 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 wanna, I know that we're almost out of time, but you know, I want to say something that I really appreciated about this book. Um, I appreciated all of it, but I really loved the fact that um, you spoke so candidly, I guess, you know, because Effa lived very candidly about being a mixed race person, right? And as we started this conversation before we came on the screen, being an ethnically ambiguous person, you <laughs> yeah. know, and you know, being a person who knew what her culture was and she knew what her community was and she knew where she was raised and who raised her, right? And so despite what she may have appeared to the white world as, um, she knew, right? And I think that there are too few stories of that, particularly for children. And I know being one of those kids that mm -hmm. it's a confusing world when you don't see yourself in any way. And you don't see the conflict that you're faced with as people try to box you in, right? Yeah. So yeah. I loved that. I think that's a sort of a hidden benefit, you know, maybe, you know, not the, in, the, the overt intent, but I think that a lot of kids are, who are in that position too are going to take a lot from that. Yeah, I, I love you saying that. And that's kind of one of those things, you know, as a writer, I, I came to the page just wanting to tell the, the most accurate and thorough version of the story that there is to tell. And yeah, that is that has come out of it. It's interesting because as I've talked about some of these things, as I've talked about, you know, colorism and, you know, the privilege that she did have in being very fair skinned and, you know, all of those things. And it's like, well, what were you trying to get across? And I'm like, this is, this is the story, right? If we're talking about, if we're talking about black people today and the opportunities that, you know, certain people get and that certain people don't. I mean, there was, there, I saw on the internet, there was like some, some drama breaking out because I guess they're redoing like the magical school bus or something like that, but they have taken two of the kids. This might be the wrong cartoon, but they're rebooting a cartoon and they've made the kids that were previously like pretty brown skin, light skin, right? And talking about, you know, how colorism is now even impacting like kids' cartoons. So yeah, particularly when we talk about, you know, that first half of the 20th century, where even at HBCUs, we're paper bag testing people. Like, you can't tell the story without talking about these things. And for Effa, I can't tell Effa's story without talking about this, because it matters that she is ambiguous, that she can kind of live, you know, on either side of this color line, because what that means is that she is showing up as a black woman because she has fully decided to. This is an intentional decision. This is not somebody who wakes up and from a mile away, I know you're black and you just got to deal with that. This is a woman who woke up and chose black. Right when she mm. didn't have to. And really a lot of people wouldn't have. I got a lot of people that are like, are you sure she's not white? And we have so internalized as a people, again, this notion of white supremacy that we think that any woman who had the opportunity to pass back then should have and would have. And we I wanted to, right? And wanted to, we cannot fathom this woman 
who had every option and said, I choose black. Right. Mm. So one last question is, Andrea, what are you going to write about or who are you going to write about next? Well, um, <laughs> and, and when can we schedule you to come back? <laughs> Whenever you want. I'm, I've had so much fun tonight, but um, yeah, I, it hasn't been announced yet, but I can say that the fall, I do, I do have a book. It's fiction um, that will be announced like in the coming weeks that will publish later this year. But as the sort of follow-up to EFA, that's also in this kind of nonfiction space hasn't been announced yet, but it will be similar in the sense that I will be telling, you know, these larger stories about, you know, American society, about Black culture and community through the lens of, it's not just one person this time, um, but a group of, a group of people in the sports space. That is super general, but, um, but yeah, lots of similarities. It will be a different sport and a different time period. So I'll say that. Ooh, well, I know that we look forward to reading it, everybody who's on this call. Um, and for those of you watching from home, please remember that um, you can purchase Baseball's Leading Lady through the link that's in your chat or on the event webpage through 1030 this evening. They make great gifts. Summer reading is coming up. Yeah. Um, you can also, thank you. You can also borrow it from the Westport Library. And I just want to thank Ramin from the History Museum, the Westport Museum for History and Culture. Sorry. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. And Andrea, this has been an absolute pleasure. I speak on behalf of all of us in Westport. We hope that you'll come back to us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so thank much, you Ramin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time with it and, and having such thoughtful things to say and questions to ask. That always excites me as an author because I'm like, are, are y'all reading this stuff? And so I feel like, you know, we all always have the best conversations with people who really sat with it and, and took time to, to understand what I was trying to do. So oh, I appreciate it. It was that. a delight. It was a delight. Thank you for writing it. Thank you. Thank you so much.